I'm so excited to have Aisha on the No More Interruptions podcast. Aisha, take it away and introduce the community to yourself. Hi, my name is Aisha Jenkins, and I partner with women looking to become single mothers by choice. I am the creator of the Start to Finish Motherhood podcast. I have a YouTube channel, and I myself am a single mother by choice to two little girls. One is four, and one will be nine soon. And oh. I'm... <laughs> amazing, amazing. Welcome, welcome to this podcast. Um, this is definitely going to be a learning pod op opportunity for me um, because I've never, I've, I watched your interview on what it was a W you were on the news, what news uh, channel? NBC, it was NBC, I believe NBC, Washington, DC. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. I was like, there's a whole community that I didn't, I wasn't yes. aware of. So this is definitely an educational uh, part for me, especially for Black women. That's mm -hmm. the other thing I have to, like, you hear, you know, our um, other, you know, Caucasian women, white women, they, they all have these types of communities. You may see it in a movie or a show or something, but never Black women. So that was the biggest interest for me, is that we actually have this in our community and we need to speak more about it. Mm -hmm. um, and embrace it, especially around the single mother thing, because we have a huge stigma around being black women. It's just, it's almost like automatic, right? Yes, yes, so, yes. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So can you, uh, the premise of our podcast is about no more interruptions. So what, can you take us to the beginning before you had your children? What was interrupting your life and that led you to that decision? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think I love the way that you framed this as specific to the Black community, because I grew up um, part of the Black Christian church. Um, and so I had in my mind that there was a right order for doing things. And some could say it's wrapped up in respectability, politics, what have you. But in my mind, there was an order to, to doing marriage and kids and doing this thing we call life. And yeah. so I entered womanhood with that thought in that frame of mind. And so I went to college. I was 19. I met and fell in love with my ex-husband. And I thought that I was on the path. We moved in together after I graduated, we got married. So all told, we were together 11 years. So six of those years we dated, five of those years we were married. And at some point I turned, I think when I turned, I got married at 24. So when I turned about 26, I was just like, yeah, I'm feeling the urge. I was done with my education. I had a little job, we had a house and I, you know, I was ready to have kids. And so my ex-husband, we kept putting off the conversation because he wasn't ready. He didn't think that our marriage was ready. And ultimately it came down to us just not being aligned and on the same page. He wanted a certain type of wife. He wanted a certain type of situation to bring children into. And if that wasn't lining up, we were not going to have kids. And so I was in my strides with my career. I was about 28 at the time where I finally had the last hard conversation about having kids. And again, it was met with a no, our relationship is not ready. And at this point we'd been together for 11 years. And so if our relationship was not ready, it was never going to be ready. Be ready. No. <laughs> right. And I was 28 and he kept saying things like women are having babies into their forties. And I'm just like, no. Right. Yeah. Because I think when you're ready as a woman, you're you're asking me at 28 to wait another 12 years. And, you know, at this point, the families are asking, when are you yes. having babies? When are you having babies? And yeah. for a while, when you're in alignment with your husband, it's just like, no, we're waiting. And you can honestly that's that's your truth. We're waiting. But right. then at 28, it's like a bunch of little pinpricks. When are you having kids? When are you having kids? And to maintain the privacy, the sanctity of your marriage, you don't say, I want to have kids. He doesn't. Right. right? Yeah. You just don't have those conversations out loud. Right. <laughs> and so I finally reached a point where 
he had said enough things that I don't, I never wanted to be primary caregiver of a kid. My job required me to travel a little bit. Well, whenever you travel for work, you need to find childcare for your child. And I was just like our child, right? And so <laughs> it was, it was little things. And in his defense, it was little things that I had heard before that I had ignored, but finally oh. it had caught up to me. And, you know, I was in love. I was right. hardheaded. I was young and I just wanted what I wanted. And so finally I reached a point where I had to woman up and, you know, just realize that this man, regardless of what I felt about what he was asking, it was what he wanted. Right. And right. And I wanted something different. And so I filed for divorce. And so I ended up divorced when I was 29. And, you know, so the mindset of you got the ring, you got to the altar, you got married, you got the house. And then to have it all fall apart is kind of, it sends you into a tailspin. And so I entered the dating pool, which I had never been a part of. And, right. you know, and dating is what it is. You have to weed through, kiss a lot of frogs. And I met some <laughs> pretty interesting, you know, men, men with kids, men without kids. And at this time, my career was just growing. And so I bought a house. And so I was dating. I had the house. And none of the situations I was dating in actually lined up. And so, you know, I looked at my life and I was crying to my siblings. I was crying to my stepmom. And I was just like, I want to have kids. I want to have a family. The holidays, it was just me as a solitary unit around all of my sisters who had had kids at a young age. So right. all of their kids were growing and running around. And I'm the auntie that's buying gifts, never taking gifts, right? I'm sitting there, the one who wanted kids the most while I hear like, oh, I just want to go hang out. I just, you know, and so it was that kind of a dynamic. And so I remember crying to my stepmom one day and I was just like, I just want to have a kid. I don't want to miss this opportunity. And right. she said, go have a baby. And so to frame up who she was as a person, she was a woman who found Christ after divorce, right? It was one of the things that led to her divorce. Right. And when she's my, she was my stepmom, by the time I came to live with her, she was in her mid fifties. Right. And so mid fifties, early sixties. And so she had a bit of perspective on yeah. you left a marriage. This is what life has to offer. Make sure you choose right, whatever your next options are going to be. And so as a woman who came up with respectability politics, I did not want to, to, to step off the path. But I knew that in order to be happy, I needed to do that. So to have someone you love and trust and respect who is, you know, from the Christian church also say, you want to do this, go ahead and do it. It was like I was getting permission. And wow. I would say throughout my entire time being a married woman and then being single, the women who poured into me and was like, you can't see clearly right now, but don't do that thing you're thinking about doing. Don't leave right. that job. Right. That that husband might not be here, but if you leave that job, you'll regret that you want to have this baby. Look at the rest of your life. You make those decisions. And so I actively made a decision at that point that, OK, this is an option for me. And right. then so that was the to answer your question. That was the point of interruption <clears throat> of interruption for my life and then set me on a path. Wow. And so you had two children yes. through the same process. Yes. So, you okay. did. I had two children as a single mother by choice. The process right. was a little bit different for both okay. kids. And can I explain what a single yeah. mother by choice is? Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> so a single mother by choice is a person who intentionally becomes a parent on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there are a number of ways you can do that. You can do it through adoption. You could do it through conception. I chose right. to do it through conception. And so what that meant for me was using a sperm bank and yeah. using a fertility clinic. And um, the process to get to each kid was just slightly different because I was a bit older. There's a five year age difference between my children. And mm -hmm. so with my first child, I just kind of did an inner uterine insemination. And okay. What that is, is like, if this is your uterus, the doctor just waits for a particular time of the month and throws sperm up there and then you cross your fingers. And I got pregnant on the second IUI when I was 37 and I delivered my first daughter at 38. Wow. And, and then, then the second child? 
The second child was a bit later and I had gone through a secondary infertility and I actually conceived my second child using IVF. Okay. I had gone through a number of different um, IVF attempts and then probably I'd had a number of miscarriages um, because of age, because of um, just, I had run out of time, but also I had a, um, a blood type mismatch with my first daughter's donor. And so oh, I could not use yeah. that donor again, but I didn't know that because again, I had blinders on and I just wanted my kids to have the same source of sperm. And so oh. I kept trying and kept trying, kept miscarrying and miscarrying. And I suspected what was causing the secondary infertility, but the doctors weren't really listening. And no. so, you know, <laughs> we get so caught up in, this is the process, stay on the path. But right. then there's not a lot that you get to choose, but I did get to choose my sperm source. And right. so when I thought that the issue was the sperm, because it's a male dominated field, nobody's gonna say it's the sperm, it's always the woman. And right. so, I switched to a different sperm donor and I ended up getting pregnant. Pregnant. Okay. Wow. And I'm just processing it all. <laughs> There's so many questions. Um, now, were you at the beginning, when your first child, were you trying to make the second child the same sperm, sperm donor? Can you do yes. that? Can you have that option? Yes. So, you know, when <laughs> you go to the sperm bank, they might have like 500 vials of right. one donor because one specimen can give you, they can slice it and dice it. Right. And you get, so you, I purchased probably, I did two and I had four more that I purchased that were on ice at the sperm bank. Um, and so I went through all of those and before it clicked for me that the sperm could be the problem. So, yes. Okay, 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 okay. Wow. Um, so while you were going through that process, what are some of the, like, mindset stuff you were telling yourself? Like, what were your thoughts? What were you, like, your, share some, can you share some of your thoughts that you were experiencing during that process? Like, the questions you were asking yourself. Well, the first question you ask yourself is, can you do this, right? You know, physically you can do it, but, you know, I didn't wake up one morning to decide that I was going to use a sperm bank, right? One morning I woke up and decided I wanted to be a single parent. And wow. so once I decided I was going to be a single parent, I then did the next natural thing. Who are the men in my circle who I respect, who I could potentially co-parent with? Right. And then, you know, I asked those men and it was met with a variety of responses. Right. Because you typically will have men that have wanted to date you, but for some reason it didn't work out. And so those people actually want to be with you. So that's like their vision. Like, yes, right. we have a kid together. And I'm just like, no. And then you will talk to some people and they're like, yes, we can go play basketball together. They had visions of being Aww. a parent. And so for me, at this point, I I just wanted to have the baby and right. not the man. And so, right. and so that was part of my journey was just unlearning. And it's just like, okay, so I knew I could do it physically. So I had to go take baby steps like, okay, where do I get the sperm from? And so then eventually, it just seemed like it was just a cleaner, um, process that that sat well with me to go with a sperm bank. And so I sat down, I'd look for black sperm, could not find black sperm. <laughs> and so, so I knew I could do it. Um, I knew I had to find sperm. But then the, the other big piece that we sometimes can't get our head around is the finances of it. It's, it's expensive. Right. Yes. And so when I went first to my consultation with the um, fertility clinic and they told me there was this thing that was called IUI and I was just like, tell me more. And they were like, you know, it ranges between like 2000 and 2500. I was like, oh, so I don't have to like go all the way to IVF, which is far more expensive. And right. so the plan was to try a couple of IUIs. And then if I got pregnant, great. If not, then we would move on to IVF. So yep. it was this, this in interim procedure and I got pregnant. And so in terms of financing, 
it was easy to kind of finance that because two tries was like $5,000. And I had that. Now, right. when I tried for my second child, I, I went all the way to the other side and did like three IVF cycles, which was hugely expensive. So I right. think, you know, there is a reality that it is significantly expensive to, to even get out the gate. And so I had to, to factor that in. I had to look at my finances to see if I can afford it. And if I couldn't afford to cash, finance it through cash, then what were my other options? And so I right. kind of went through those different options. You can finance part of it through cash. Is it covered by your insurance? You know, what other access do you have? Credit cards, what have you. And so I ended up using a combination of all of those to get to my second child, combination of cash, um, loans, credit cards, um, diagnostics were covered by my, um, my health insurance. And so that was kind of the journey that I went on. And what I will caution people is that yes, you can do this. And yes, you can finance it. But also when you think about financing it, you also have to think about whatever debt I incur now, I have to add that to childcare debt or you know, paying for childcare and my regular life after the baby is here. And so there are some things that you can do to mitigate some of that. Um, some people have gone out and gotten second jobs to pay for the fertility portion of it. And then their regular salary will cover childcare and all of regular life. And so some people would get jobs where they pay um, for fertility coverage as part of their health insurance. And so there are just different ways that you you could look at it, but it's definitely worth taking the time to sit down and think about what your options were. And so I kind of did that. Now, I didn't do it alone. Um, when you opened um, the episode, you talked about the single mother by choice community being predominantly white. And I will say that there's about, there's a good overlap where it's it's race agnostic, right? We all wanna have babies. Um, it's not always covered by insurance. How do we finance this? And so one of the first things I did when I considered this path was I took to the internet and I found communities and I started asking questions. And so my journey, the thinking phase of my journey took about two years. And so from the time I was about 31, 32 to the time that I actually started actively trying was about five years, right? And so I gave myself one more hot girl summer. I dated a little bit. I got money together. I Googled and I researched. I joined communities. I asked questions. So by the time I was just ready to start, I kind of knew what my path was, that it was conception, I would go to a sperm bank, and this is how I would pay for it. And so it is kind of a journey. So you stay there thinking and planning um, for a good while before you execute the plan. So it's not a quick, so to help other people understand, it's not a quick fix. It took you a good couple of years to come to this decision. It did. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very good. That's uh, it's it's beautiful. And so, how are your daughters now? Like, how are you? How do you like? I guess you just do you say you're a single? Because I have. I'll tell you. I'll be very transparent with you. I have a problem with the word single mom. I I I'm a mom. Is how I address uh -huh. myself. I yeah. don't think that is. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Your business. Uh -huh. I'm mom. Right. If I'm yes. doing it with somebody, you're doing it with nobody. I'm a mom. Yes. Um, but how do you like? How do like as you move through the world? How are you moving through the world? I know you have the single mom by choice community, but mm -hmm. when you get into questions where people actually know your story and they say why, they ask you your why around mm -hmm. it. What do you say? Right. So. <laughs> Okay, so I think before even knowing that the single mother by choice community existed, it was either you're a married mother or you're a single mother, right? Or you're like a divorced, right? And so I think when it's that black and white, you say I'm a mom, right? And so for me, there was the third option of being a single mom by choice, which some people in the single mother by choice community will say, 
I'm this kind of single mom. I'm not that kind of single mom, right? So there's that dynamic in there as well. Now, understanding that the single mother by choice community is a predominantly white community, what they're essentially saying, what I interpret that as, I'm a white single mom who's privileged and middle-aged. This kid is wanted. I'm not that brown or black single mom who has a broken home and who's poor. So when people ask me, how do I identify? I identify as a single mom. And I do that to honor my sisters who were single moms, not by choice. But I also am in a privileged position to a, either encapsulate and say I'm a part of or to separate myself out of. And I choose to be a joiner. And I choose to say, regardless, society is not going to look at me and say, how much money did you have in the bank when you conceived your child? You know, who did you conceive your child with? They're going to say, OK, you're single. You've got kids. You're a single mom. And the worst thing you could be is a black single mom, you know, to to society. And it's just like, no, I'm going because of non-traditional because of the traditional single mom. I have cover. Right. No one has to look at my choice as something political. Right. Like, yeah. oh, you're breaking down the black family because you're a single mom and you went to a sperm bank. Right. I have cover. I don't have to share that part of my story if I don't want to. You can think whatever you want. Oh, she had a deadbeat dad. You know, the father died. It's a divorce. Right. What have you. But I have cover in terms mm. of I don't have to say I went to a sperm bank. You don't have to know my financial situation. You don't have to right. put me in a box. Right. I'm with thousands, millions of other single moms. That's my community. That's the space that I navigate. That's the space that I choose to honor. And so when people ask me, you know, how do I identify? I identify as a single mom, you know, but then when single moms are pit against married moms, we're moms. So we could fake the funk. I was about to be a mom who was carrying 85% of the load, right? My husband was right. like, I'm not a primary caregiver. My husband was like, if you travel for work, you need to find childcare. I do all of that now. Yeah. I do all of that now. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. Um, so your single mom's community by choice, what are some of the, like the goals you have for that community? Okay. And where do you so, see it in the next five, 10 years? So I do have a Facebook community that I run. It's called Melanated Single Mothers by Choice. It's primarily yeah. for Black women and women of color who want to come together. Um, we do have people who are just getting started on the journey. But based on where I am, I'm kind of like in that middle point where I can look back and say, oh, OK, there were lessons to be learned. Let me share this. Um, but then also I'm firmly in the parenting stage where my youngest is about to be out of daycare. So I'm about mm -hmm. to transition into another phase. Um, yeah. And so you, you, I can't emphasize more the importance of community. Um, I still believe that it takes a village to raise a child. And for me, I've been really intentional about building that village. And I pull from work friends, old friends, family, my single mother by choice community. And so we all just kind of come together and we understand the challenges, we understand the struggle. And so, and you have girlfriends, right? You carve out time to do social outings, to do brunches, to do happy hours, you know, and, and we get it. We get that you're looking at your phone because the sitter, you know, might say something or you have to leave early or if you have a sick kid, you have to drop out of the event. So we get it. Right. Community is so important. And so I've been a part of a number. I've been a part of the white SMC community, which was really pivotal when I had to shift to a different donor, when I ran into roadblocks with trying for my second and didn't really know where to turn. I had to look to people who typically have not had barriers put in front of them and understand, you know, what the options are oh, and then take them and own them. Right. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, if it's not for myself or other black single mothers by choice, we're speaking out. 
other Black women who want to have children and feel brave enough to take this will say, I don't know anybody who's done this. I don't know if I can do right. it. And the reason I'm so public with my story is because you can do it. And at some point, once you get over those first five years where people are like, oh, who's the dad? Or there's daycare pickup and drop off. Yeah. After five, when it's just school, you are a single mom. You are in the trenches and you are trying to parent your kids to be the best little humans that they can be. Nobody right. cares how they were conceived, right? Right, right. And so, so it's getting for so, past the first five years is what you're saying, yeah. right? Getting past the first five years and you don't have to do that by yourself, right? There right. are communities that exist. So find your communities. I spent a lot of time in the white SMC community before I created, you know, Melanated Single Mothers by Choice. And I still have a birth cohort with my first child, which consisted of like 15 women. We were in a community. We were all pregnant together. Our kids, we, we did vacations together. We're about to hit our 10 year reunion next year. So we're planning a trip together. Like these kids all have the same story. So, and that is, intentional. You have to be intentional about creating a single mother by choice community because also the blessing and curse of being a black woman is that you can get lost in other black single mothers. Remember I talked about that cover. People yeah. don't have to know you use a sperm donor. You can just join other single moms. But the yeah. thing is, is that you're always going to tell your kid the truth. So your kid is going to have a conception story that is different. And you want right. to make sure you're, there's a community that supports your kid, right? Mm -hmm. That has the same story that says, hey, how did you answer that question? Or when somebody said this to you, how did you handle that? You're not going mm -hmm. to get that from kids who have a living person that they can point to and say, that's my daddy, right? Whether yeah. whatever their scenario is, they're not yeah. going to have to tell people, my mom used a donor. I, you know, my mom used a sperm bank. You know, that's my reality. But if you're intentional about building single mother by choice friends, then their kids become friends with your kids. And when they hit those rough teenage years, they have a built in community. When they stop talking to you, they will talk to someone. Yeah. And you want it to be yep. someone who is going to talk the same talk that you ascribe to for that part of their life. And that's where, you know, be going out and, and making friends with other single moms by choice, making sure you have those friends, have other single mom friends, have other married friends, but don't neglect the single mother by choice community. Mm. So community is a definite a must have as you're going through this process. I would say so, yes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And now what state are you in? Cause I'm in Toronto, Canada. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, where are you? I'm in um, Virginia. So I'm an East okay. Coast girl, born and raised city girl. Um, yeah. And so there, there is also something to be said about um, having access to the diversity. And so when I talk about diversity, it's not just racial diversity, it is diversity in all forms and making sure that that, that is what gets imported in your kid. Like that's important to me. Yeah. So I, East Coast, Coast City Girl, born and raised, and mainly a lot of it has to do with diversity. Oh, okay, beautiful, amazing. And so how are your kids now? <laughs> They are like, what's running the fun part of being a mom. <laughs> they are running the shop. I will tell you, it is one, it's a joy. And I will tell people that when I think about my life and I think about the path that I could have taken and the path that I chose, I feel like I reached into the sky and I've stolen joy. Like, and it's not just those kids, it's being able to to nurture little people is a gift, whether they were my kids or not, but they happen to be my kids. But then, you know, having them just kind of gave, given me a, a deeper purpose, right? You get to right. watch people grow with the values that you know are important. And so when I'm raising my kids, I'm not just raising my kids because God gives them to you for a period of time. If if you're religious and I am. Yeah. And I think that I've been blessed and I've been honored to be able to raise these two little people to who they're supposed to be. And I pray that 
I am the mom that they need me to be so that they can be the women that God means for them to be and to go out in the world. And, you know, we're about to be a global society. I would love it if they were to go out and be change makers, right? And, you know, and just be good people out in the world. And so when I look at them and the way that they treat each other and the way that they treat me and the way that they just are who they are, it is so amazing to be a witness to that. And I, you know, I had nieces and nephews. I was allowed, but so much influence on them. But these are are my kids and I get to ask them questions like, how did that make you feel? What were you thinking? And these kids are thinking kids. And when you ask them, what are they thinking? And for them to turn around and have a conversation with you, even at eight and four, it's just like, this is amazing. And I am so lucky to be a part of it. So to have them in my life right now is like, you know, me saying, I'm hopeful for the future. And, you know, they're going to be change makers. And so I feel, I feel great. You know, I don't get much sleep. (laughs) I step over kid messes every day, you know, so I'm not saying that it is easy, but I'm saying that the way that I look at it, it brings back a little bit of magic and it brings back a little bit of hope in a world that feels like it's not there. And I don't tell them this because I don't want them to carry that burden, you know, but I watch the things that they gravitate toward and I'm like, that's a good thing. I'm going to nurture that, you know, and just create space for them to be who they're going to be, but be intentional about some of the things that you put in their space and be hopeful that they gravitate towards it. And It's a joy. I love it. Awesome. Awesome. So before we wrap up, tell how do people, because we're in Canada. So um, I, and I don't know if these communities exist in Canada, but Uh how would, if they wanted to participate in your Facebook group, can you share like how to connect with you and learn more? Oh, yes. If you're on Facebook, you can search Melanated Single Mothers by Choice. I have a YouTube channel and my YouTube channel has different links to my social media. I'm also on Instagram. I have the podcast Start to Finish Motherhood, um, which is going into season two, currently recording. Um, And so those are just different ways for people to find me. But also the Single Mother by Choice, the, the largest community that I started in is global. It's international. And so at the worst case, okay. join a community. It doesn't necessarily have to be Black. You will find us when you need your, your Black sisters. You will find us, right? But start someplace because the information that's being shared is race agnostic. Take what you need, leave the rest, right? Just get your foot yeah. in the door, get yourself started. Um, and so that's what I would say there. If you want the the black perspective on how we're actually doing this and, you know, the types of things that are important to the black community, the unlearning, the sisterhood, the support, you can find me at Start to Finish Motherhood. You can just Google me, listen to the podcast, check out the YouTube. Fantastic. Um, so one of the ways that we like to wrap up uh, the No More Interruptions podcast is with rapid fire questions. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? So what is one strategy that you would recommend to another woman who is currently going or seeking this type of experience, um, uh, interruption in their life? Right. I think you have to block out the noise and you have to sit with yourself and ask yourself at the end of this life, what will I regret? And then proceed from there. I try to live my life with no regrets. Beautiful. And who's someone that inspires you? Oh, I would say probably my stepmom because she's the one when the pandemic hit and the girls were here, we could not get to see her. And last summer we got to see her. So she got to meet the two little kids who would not have been here if it wasn't for her saying, go ahead, go get that baby. And so, so yeah. Yeah. Wow. And what's a non-negotiable in your life right now? A non-negotiable in my life is peace. I have to have peace in my house. If there's going to be drama, it's going to be drama from the three little people who live there. And it's going to be, you need to do laundry. You need to brush your teeth. You know, so I protect my peace at all costs. Yeah. Wow. 
Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I'm so excited. I can't wait till this airs. This is, I know a lot of people are looking forward to it, but I'm also mm -hmm. learned so much. And Aww. yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you for, for sharing having your story me. and your experience and building this community. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Anytime that I can get to talk to people about my journey and it's just like, you know, you do have options and ultimately I want every woman and every black woman, especially to be able to live life on her terms as she see fits as they see fit. And so, so yeah, so I share my story in hopes of letting someone know that you can do it. You can live the life that you dream. Beautiful. Thank you. Now we just have to wait for the recording. <laughs>